Hello, uh, it's a pleasure to invite you all to the seminar today. Our speaker today will be our own phone stock. A big day he actually now shared with NCNS Paris because he is hired on a he is hired by IPM through the Indo French Semifra grant. He has been here already for two years almost, or not two years, one and a half years almost. And he will be speaking today about his latest work on horizon cap beyond equilibrium. Over to you, Abhijit. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, unlike other speakers, I cannot start by saying that uh, it would have been a pleasure to be in Chennai in person. I'm in person, but still, the talk is uh, online. So, as I said, I mean, this talk is about uh, computation of certain uh, finger tail dish correlation out of equilibrium for certain flow in the boundary using this uh, horizon cap method. I will explain what this is. And this is based on a work in progress uh, with Ayan and Kushali. I mean, it's supposed to come out at some point uh, this month. Okay. So let me first give you a sort of five minute motivation, like why is this uh, work relevant? Okay. So real time correlations, as we know, are key to understanding numerous interesting phenomena around us, from starting from particle production to death quenching to thermalization and so on and so forth. And the key ingredient for this uh, study is, is this object, the sugar tail dish uh, correlation function, depending on this growth time path. I'll explain what these things are later. Now, the problem is that the most of the systems that we are interested in are inherently many body and strongly coupled. So, for arbitrary and complicated initial state, I mean, this object is difficult to model. I mean, there are these sugar deep Dyson equations and all the, those things are there, but this is in general difficult problem in the field theory context uh, for this kind of system. So, okay. Now, in our talk, we are essentially interested uh, in Bjorken flow, uh, which describes the expansion and cooling down of matter produced in heavy and collision. So, in addition to being many body and strongly coupled, it's also out of equilibrium. So the stage of difficulty is even more beyond that. And we are interested in out of an out of equilibrium showing a this correlation for this flow. Okay. So this is the problem that we're interested in. Now, holography is always a tractable approach to tackle I mean, such many body and strongly coupled systems. And in fact, there is this uh, GKPW prescription, uh, which uh, came out of Polyakovitan. I mean, which works pretty well when you are talking about Euclidean correlators. But Lorentzian correlators comes with their own uh, technical challenges. I mean, there is a vast literature. Uh, I'll mention some of them in the next slide. And this problem is even more complicated when you are out of equilibrium. Okay. So given the difficulty of this problem, now this problem is not something new, it's actually age only problem. And uh, there has been historically various attempts uh, along this direction. The first significant one was by Sonnet Stad in it back on 2002. I mean, but the conjecture, so it's a kind of conjecture that uh, this retardedness of this advanced means function, the boundary, uh, this requires a particular ingoing or outgoing horizon condition, I mean, boundary condition at the horizon. I mean, this was a remarkable prescription back at that time. This was mostly based on the grounds of causality. However, the identification of this means function in the boundary was kind of ad hoc. I mean, they just identified certain term at the boundary as this. And it does not follow from uh, functional differentiation of some action or something like that, for generating function like that. So this prescription was eventually uh, improved, I mean, uh, by Son and Herzog in the following year that they computed this finger tail dish correlations uh, using this functional differentiation method, using this uh, thermomorphic double structure of this uh, eternal tailless black box. Okay. I mean, this was a, I mean, here, here they compute the entire GAB matrix and not just retarded and uh, advanced thing using this action, I mean, functional differentiation of some on shell action. Okay. And so later, in 2008, I mean, the seminal work came out from by uh, Skandinavis and Bandris. Uh, so, where they essentially give a full bulk extension of this 
shrink a Keldish contour. I mean, the, the picture is sort of like, so these are like the euclidean and these are the Lorentzian arms. So the bulb extension is like, you fill the bulb space time corresponding to this Euclidean arm by some Euclidean space time and the Lorentzian arm by some Lorentzian space time. Okay. And you essentially have to do them using this junction transition. Uh, for example, I mean, if you are considering thermal states, then you have to identify this Euclidean, sorry, Euclidean section. This. Okay. So now, uh, the, now the problem is that, I mean, these two prescriptions, these are only for thermal equilibrium. But this is for, this is a general kind of prescription. I mean, but the thing is that this kind of complicated because of this design brewing thing. I mean, when you're out of equilibrium, uh, so this design brewing thing is kind of subtle. So it's not directly implementable for such things. Okay. However, recently, an interesting prescription has been put forward by these three people, Crossley, Glorious, and Liu, we'll call them CGL. But the bulk realization of the Schrodinger Kellish contour out of equilibrium. Okay. And uh, however, they have used this prescription only in a static geometry where the dynamics is in kind of the boundary dynamics of some probe scalar field. The sources have some slowly varying boundary dynamics. However, they do not back react. So the geometry in two sense is not dynamic. It's not, geometry is not, I mean, it's static. It's not dynamical out of equilibrium. So the out of equilibrium dynamics is in this probe system. So what we plan to do is, we used to use this prescription, which is the horizon gap prescription, in the context of a truly dynamical geometry, okay, which is dual to the Bjorken flow at the boundary. So the Bjorken flow is out of equilibrium thing. And so we have to compute its correlators using this prescription in the bulk. Okay. And the geometry is also dynamic. So let me give you a brief outline of the talk. Uh, so in the first part, I'll essentially be talking about uh, the conformer Bjorken flow in a conformer theory and how to construct this uh, dual. The part two will be sort of, I mean, I'll be talking about finger tail correlations and closed time paths. The first day I will give a very lightning review of the finger tail closed time path and boundary and uh, how it's realized in the bulk at this equilibrium context. Then I will tell you what is this horizon cap prescription and uh, why it is supposed to work at uh, out of equilibrium. Then I'll also give a consistency check of this, I mean, thing at the level of equilibrium. So once you can trust this at the level of equilibrium, then you can also probably trust it outside equilibrium. And in this context, I will tell you about a new matrix construction of this Schwinger uh, Kelly's Green's function. Which gives a very compact way to write down this uh, Schrodinger Kildish correlation. Okay. So now, once we are motivated that, okay, this works, I mean, this works at equilibrium, then we will use this machinery with outer equilibrium constraints, and I will study the scalar fluctuation of the flow. Uh, so, I want to study the scalar field in this dual dynamical background of this flow. And then I'll extract the Schrodinger Kildish correlator both at equilibrium and beyond. So, this is the rough plan. So the first part will be kind of basic. This part is uh, conceptual and this last part will be rather technical, but there's the end result, which is beautiful. So yeah, let's get uh, into it. So your I mean, so this study dates back to 1983 and I was one of the pioneers who were interested in studying the space-time evolution of the matter forming this uh, heavy air collision. Okay. How does this object, this blue ball that's produced with the collision, evolve in space time? Okay. Now, this heavy ion collision is actually a, uh, it's a complicated process. I mean, if you want to do the theory of it, this is actually very difficult. So, it's based, this study is based on certain assumptions, which is very crucial. So, the first assumption is that the flow is longitudinal along the collision axis. Okay. Now, in experimental context, this is actually a reasonable uh, assumption if you are close to this axis. I mean, by close, I mean that suppose you're, I mean, so it's only valid up to the radii, trans, up to the radii of the colliding nucleus, okay. But we want to preserve this longitudinal invariance all the, all the way in the transverse direction. So we want to model the nuclei, this colliding nuclei, 
has infinitely extended shape along this transverse direction. So this longitudinal uh, uh, symmetry, uh, this flow, this symmetry is actually preserved for every x y. So in the lab frame, which is like this T Z Z is the collision axis and it's perpendicular the perpendicular directions. The flow is given by this flow velocity. The second assumption is kind of still reasonable. I mean, uh, okay, it says that I mean, commencement of local equilibrium shortly after collision, which is a which is not a, I mean, this is a quite a reasonable thing if you are in sufficiently high energy collision. So once you have this assumption, now we can define our local hydrodynamic variables. So the third and the most crucial is that we'll assume boost invariance for this flow. Okay. Uh, so in a in a in a experimental language, it's like uh, focusing on the central plateau region. Uh, however, I mean this is a very crucial assumption, and to use this symmetry, we will essentially switch over from this lab frame to this million coordinates. Okay, where this mean length of this tau and zeta are the proper time and the rapidity variables. Okay, so by boost invariance, I mean invariance with respect to zeta. And these are related to this lab frame by this. So in this frame and this mean length coordinates, the boundary metric looks like this, and the core velocity takes this form. Okay, so it's kind of co moving frame for the flow. Okay. So now the implication of this assumption is that, I mean, if you make your initial condition zeta independent, then it remains so throughout the flow. I mean, the, the equations actually will respect the symmetry. So we'll assume it for every time. And also we we'll furthermore assume that the, our, all our variables are independent of uh, the transverse coordinates because they're just, I mean, they're there. I mean, the role will be clear later, but for now they are just uh, expected additions. So with, based on this assumption, so let us now define the flow by the stress division. So this is a homogeneous and an isotropy. It's homogeneous doesn't depend on spatial coordinates. And there's an isotropy because the pressure in the longitudinal along the collision axis and in the transverse direction are not the same. Okay. And we have to study this flow in a conformal setup. So the conformal word identities will now relate this PL and PG to this epsilon. So epsilon is now the energy density is now the only degree of freedom. Now on top of this, if you further claim that this flow attains perfect behavior at late times, I mean, which is known pretty well, then this epsilon tau, if you impose this condition on this equation, then the behavior of epsilon tau is fixed and it takes this particular form. And in conformal field theory, the relation between energy and temperature is based just on dimensional ground. So if this is your scaling of energy with time, then this must be the scaling of temperature with time. So what it tells you is that this flow is actually this is expanding and a cooling perfect fluid at very late times. So this is expanding, this is the cooling. And at finite times, I mean this uh, this energy density admits this hydrodynamic expansion, where this uh, new is kind of, a, this is the object's new, where this epsilon is the initial energy density that is formed in the collision process. And the tau is the time at which we say that the local equilibrium is commenced. Okay, so these are some initial parameters. And the coefficient of the expansions, these are determined by this transport coefficient. For example, lambda one is determined by this shear viscosity. So this is the flow in the boundary, and we have to construct its dual. However, there is a very crucial point here because in typical fluid gravity setup, when you are want to construct the bulk wall of a flow, the often the starting point is a geometry which corresponds to thermal equilibrium. However, in this case, as you can see, that at late times, this the temperature is still not constant; it's still decaying. So this Bjorken flow can actually be mapped to a constant temperature flow at late times using certain time parameterization and value scaling of this one. Okay. So under and time, if you if you uh, I mean if you take the combined effect of this on the metric and the stress tensor and everything, then this is the form that you get. So now you can see that now the energy density. At late time is constant. That means the temperature at late time is constant. 
So this is what this is what we call the wild musical pyramid. Did you define the sigma somewhere? Uh, sigma is like uh, okay. So I'm now doing a time parameterization. This is my sigma. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So now this, what is important here is that, as you can see that now in this coordinates, the longitudinal direction zeta, this actually increases in time, expands in time. The transverse direction actually decreases, I mean, it shrinks in time, but in a way, so that the overall volume factor is constant. Okay, so had it been a perfect fluid throughout, this energy density would have been uh, constant throughout the flow, but it's not, the dissipative effects uh, come into play at finite times, so in zero half. It's, it's, it's only, I mean, this constant only at late times. Okay. So now we have essentially a flow in the boundary, which thermalizes at late time. So now we want to construct a dual. And uh, so, yeah, we have this Bjorken flow in this Milne coordinates tau of zeta and x, and this y viscal Bjorken flow in this sigma and uh, the spatial coordinates. So here we have an expanding and a cooling uh, perfect fluid at late time with temperature uh, falling like this. So here it happens, for example, in t equal to four, boundary space time dimension n equal to four. But in this case, at late time, we have a constant temperature. So suppose we want to construct the, uh, so how do we construct the dual of this flow? So let's start from the original flow first. Again, these two flows are related by this uh, time parameterization and this wide scale. So let us first start uh, by considering the bulk dual of this. So the precision is that we have to solve Einstein equation with a negative is cosmological constant, subject to the boundary conditions that this bulk metric should asymptote to this Milne metric at the boundary. And the brown X test density compute from the solution that much resemble this uh, Yorkin flow stress tensor. So, uh, so based on this, you can construct uh, this uh, dual of this flow. And we'll construct the dual in this Eddington Finkel's time coordinate. Now this coordinate is not the conventional one. So here, for example, uh, my R is the radial direction and the tau is the EF time in the bulk, which is the boundary is the proper time. Okay. However, the problem, as I said, in this coordinate is at a late time, the temperature falls off like this start to the power minus threes, which means that the horizon will be dynamical at this point. It will behave something like this. So as I said that the starting point has to be a uh, static black hole space time around which we'll uh, consider this hydrodynamic expansion shown. So this is actually not a good thing to start. This is not a good starting point. So it's a, we'll be mostly focused on this dual of this while we scale. So again, you can con con uh, construct the flow, I mean, the dual using the same prescription here. And here the coordinates are like this. V is now the radial direction. And the sigma is now the left time. And from bulk perspective, these two are related by this bulk victim of this. So now, as you can see that this time parameter is essentially the same at the boundary. And the analog of this wild scaling in the bulk is this uh, rescaling of this, I mean, this radial direction. So now, as you can see in this V sigma coordinate, this particular surface, Rh tau to the power minus third, is actually a constant. So this gives you a static horizon at late time. So we'll mostly talk about uh, this part. And we can obviously obtain the results by doing this while it's scaling back to this original flow. So the bulk dual of this Bjorken flow, I mean, the, we'll realize the flow, I mean, in three plus one boundary dimensions. So the bulk dimension is five. So we, the answers that we take is this. Okay, where are this, we have introduced these three functions, A, L, and K. And uh, so the vacuum of the boundary corresponds to setting this to zero. Okay. So, the flow, we have introduced this, and we have to impose proper boundary condition on this so that it gives you the millimetry of the boundary. Now, to construct the dual, essentially, we have to solve for this A, L, and A using this Einstein equation with the negative cosmological constant. The problem is that, I mean, these functions are difficult to solve in both V and sigma exactly and simultaneously. So, you have to solve it in one approximation. 
So what we do, we perform a late time expansion of this geometry in terms of sigma, and at every order in sigma, we software to solve this equation, radial equation. So at every order, we know the geometry everywhere in, a, everywhere in the radial direction. For example, at the leading order in sigma expansion, the solutions look like this. So this is like a, apparently looks like a static black hole because the horizon it has some constant location. But we have to keep in mind that the sigma, the zeta, and this directions, this perpendicular direction, they are expanding and contracting. Okay. So although the horizon location is phased, but this boundary spatial directions, I mean, these are, I mean, these other spatial directions, they are sort of dynamic. Okay. So it's kind of thermal equilibrium, not exactly a mechanical equilibrium. So that's why I call it apparently. And we will see the consequences of this. Uh, I mean, this. I mean, this expansion and shrinking of this boundary coordinates later in the computation. Okay. And this is a reminiscent of the late time thermalization of the Y scheme. And the subleading. So the point is, I think that if you look at homogeneous fluctuations, it will see a static black hole geometry because homogeneous fluctuations will not see this expansion and contact. Yeah, uh, homogeneous, if you take, I mean, the, but I'm coming to fluctuation later. I'm just talking about the geometry at this point. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I'll comment on that later. So, okay. So, so in this expansion, the leading piece is just a static black hole. It's like a static black hole, but you have to keep this dynamics in mind. And the subleading order corrections gives you departure from this thermal equilibrium, the static black hole. For example, I'll show you the first subleading order solution. Let's take this form. Here, alpha is a degree of freedom that we have left. I mean, that we have at every order. This is the residual gauge function of this paint and pickles time page. And now the thing is that with this correction, the event horizon is shift from V equal to one. Okay, but using this alpha, we can always map it back to V equal to one. But we'll not do that here. I mean, we'll keep this, we'll retain this degree of freedom later for our construction. So on. Okay. This problem will be automatically taken care of. And the other point is that this metric, this function GV is finite at V equal to one. So the geometry at this V equal to one is regular and analytic. I mean, it's obviously regular. I mean, regular because we're using this ingoing uh, editor pickles and coordinate, but this community set is also important for a later purpose. Uh, Abhi, this is the, uh, Abhi, could you could you motivate this other non-expanding factors in the metric and such? Sorry, what? In the metric ansatz, uh, there were these expansion factors, but other than that, there were additional factors, right? Uh, could you motivate them as well a bit? Sorry, what are the other factors? Uh, there's other factors which come with the longitudinal direction or even transverse direction or even so the- Here, there is only three functions, right? This A, L, and V, K. And we are expanding these functions in this late time expansion. Right, right. But the, but the, I I'm ask, I was asking if uh, you could uh, motivate this uh, expansion a bit more, uh, like the inserts a bit more, like how Which these answer? how these functions are placed exactly. This, this a, yes. Okay. So the idea is that you first start, as I said. I mean, so you know the vacuum. Okay. What is the vacuum? This is the uh, this Milne metric or the y Wieskel Milne metric. So you first construct. I mean, uh, the dual of this. Uh, that is just ADS, okay. So for example, if you set this three to zero, so this will be some version of this ADS point. Okay. So on top of this, so this is our, like this characterize our black hole of the pool. So these are the functions now to, I mean, this function cannot be solved exactly in both V and Sigma simultaneously, but the idea is that we have to, we need to have the solution at every radial position, okay. Abhi, I think so the vacuum meaning A is equal to one, no, not zero. Sorry, what? No, no, A will be zero. Oh, sorry. You know, a capital A. Capital A is one or zero? For the vector? Uh, I think it's a zero. Okay. Vacuum is like setting okay, it's some, some constant. Okay, so it's not okay. Most likely I'm yeah, okay. Yeah, so the idea is that we need to know this geometry is function at every radial position, but we cannot solve this. Uh, based on we can solve Einstein equation exactly based on the answer. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, uh, maybe what I want is if even if you set a l k to zero, the metric you land on is not any of the familiar forms. No, so I was just wondering. Uh, 
Okay, if you if you want to see, okay, first of all, is Einstein Finkelstein, and this is not. I mean, this is actually not the exact Einstein Finkelstein corresponding. Uh, it's actually some diffeomorphic version of that. Okay. So. Uh, but uh, Akhil, this uh, metric is well known. Actually, this is uh, it's simply the while we scaling is novel, but this is, has been worked out long ago by Yanni Heller and others. So essentially, uh, you need uh, non-trivial K and L to capture viscous effects because your pressure is. Non isotropic when you go away from the perfect fluid limit. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I mean the A A L K tends to zero limit. You're saying it's just the when you set A L K to this uh, vacuum values having has shown. Ah, this is simply the solution of this is pure ADS with the boundary metric, which is the while we scale. Oh, uh, is this a while we scaled? Okay. Uh, Milne and, metric. And, if you have the while we scale Milne metric as a, as a boundary metric, uh -huh. the vacuum solution is simply the pure ADS. Is there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, just another point is that uh, if you compute uh, the stress tensor, you will also find the wild anomaly. There is also wild anomaly factor which doesn't play any role. Yeah, so this is summarizes our construction for this uh, bus. So you can essentially compute a higher and higher order in sigma expansion. I mean, those are essentially more dirty solutions. I'm not showing it here. So yeah, we at least, I mean, in principle, you can numerically solve this uh, dual, you can construct this dual order. Okay. So now let's come to the main ingredient. I mean, there's this shumak in this correlations. So real-time correlation is to this folded time part. It's a uh, pretty well known. I mean, so suppose you want to compute this vacuum correlator. Uh, so you can obviously first you have to prepare this state. I mean, this uh, vacuum by uh, Euclidean time translation by a finite amount. Then you get this vacuum. Then you start moving along this Lorentzian direction. You insert your operators at t1, t2. Now, because of this part, you have to again come back. But at this point, this is not a vacuum. So again, you, you can get your vacuum by time translation up to plus infinity along the Euclidean direction. So this gives you a nice uh, path of the visualization of this correlation. And this can actually be generalized to any state. By any state, I mean, you cannot, I mean, state that cannot be prepared by this Euclidean path. So the main idea is that you identify this Brier gate, which is this trace, so which in this picture goes from these dots. And uh, yeah, but you, you have no such Euclidean path integral picture here. So this dot is like you are identifying your initial facts. So now on this close time path, you can uh, introduce your operators every uh, any wherever you wish, up in upper arm, lower arm, and that gives you the Schumacher uh, correlation. But it's a product of operators, so you have to give some ordering of this. So the, the conventional path ordering prescription is that in the upper arm, the operators are, I mean, usual path time ordered. In the lower arm, this anti time ordered. And suppose you have an operator in one arm and in, only the second arm, then the second operator in the second arm, lower arm will always come to the left. So the lower arm always has a higher quantum time than the upper arm. Okay. But there is this one state actually which also have another state that has this path integral uh, picture, which is this thermal state. So suppose you start from the state here, you insert your operators and come back. So you start at Ti, then this is some I epsilon, so it's Ti minus I epsilon. As you reach Ti minus I beta, you have to identify the initial path. So this is the periodic picture. This is the close time path uh, thing, and the inserting operator on this, you get the Schwinger tilde. Okay. And the generating function for this Schwinger tilde uh, correlation is given by this. You can generalize it to arbitrary species of operator. I'm just talking about one such rule. Okay, now, as I said, that for arbitrary rule, this object is difficult to compute uh, in a field theory in general. But holography gives you a very simple prescription, which is that the generating function for the connected correlators is simply given by the on shell action of the fields of the, I mean, the fields dual to this operator with the sources at the boundary condition. Okay. So that's the prescription. However, for the Schwinger Kelly's thing, I mean, just this prescription is not enough. You have to also give a bulk analog of this contour thing. It's just not a retarded or advanced thing. It needs a certain proper description of this contour in the bulk. And for example, when this row is actually row thermal, 
there's actually a very nice geometric visualization of this uh, of this i mean of this contour in the bulk which was essentially the work by son and hazard so they say that at equilibrium and particularly for this value epsilon equal to beta by 2 between the lorentzian arms the forward and the reverse arm of the schwinger kelly contour are to be identified with the r and l boundary of the eternal radius black hole with this temperature t beta times so now as you define the contour with operators you turn on fields in the bar now this experiment has certain shortcomings i mean beyond the three level uh, two point function but that is that's there but still i think this gives you a very nice visualization of how this uh, holographic principle actually works and so i'll be spend some time on this so the idea is that you have to evaluate this on cell action which is the generating function of the corrected correlators with this boundary condition that the field phi at the right and the left boundary gives you the sources in the upper and lower so you have to solve for, so you have to solve this i mean solve this field in the entire geometry and the way you solve it is like first you solve in this r region you come close to the horizon you continue it to the l region okay and the best known coordinates for this purpose is the kruskal coordinates qv so in terms of kruskal coordinates the solution okay the solution are typically expanded in this in out basis in going and out basis so near the horizon the solution takes this particular form okay. so now analytic continuation from this r to l is like moving along this v and u axis so suppose i'm going for this in mode and going from positive v to negative v in going from r to l and for the outgoing mode i'm going from negative u to positive u going from r to l okay. as you can see that this mode they have a branch point at this v equal to 0 and u equal to 0 so you can go straight you have to take analytic paths and in principle you can go both up down and up and down okay. so this essentially gives you four modes in the l region but we have only two boundary conditions to fix so in that case one needs additional boundary condition at this horizon at this u equal to v equal to 0 and that says that so the schwinger kelly correlator in the bulk perspective is like a feynman property okay so the causal response which corresponds to this ingoing mode must carry positive energy and it has to be continued in the lower half plane and the acausal response which corresponds to the outgoing mode and they have to be continued in the they have the negative energy and they have to continue in the upper half so this gives you exactly two modes in the l so once you have this in the r and l you will now impose go to the boundary impose these conditions evaluate the on shell action functional derivative you get this thing and this gives you the right results and is it 2d cft at both at finite and zero temperature how about the i mean the limitation of this is that this is only true for this epsilon equal to beta over k Whereas in our case, away from equilibrium, one typically chooses this separation between the lowest and the to be zero. And also this two-sided picture does not exist. Okay. So we need generalization of this. And let me try to motivate this way. So the main essence of this entire song and dance is that the analytic condition of the R and L in terms of coordinates is just given by this analytic condition of this crucial coordinates. Even now, when you have essentially one side, is we do not have a two side, one sided case, then one can equivalently use the ingoing area temperatures type coordinates for this one half, the R region. It's as good as this QV for that region. And this analytic continuation in terms of this uh, ingoing area temperatures time takes this form. You have to use the relation between these coordinates. So, this is the analytic continuation. And this is for this epsilon, epsilon equal to beta over. However, in principle, you can generalize this for any beta or any bar epsilon within this range, which is the periodic cycle of time. In that case, it is supposed to be given by this. And particularly at bar epsilon equal to zero, so this is the analytic continuation. Okay. So the ingoing Einstein Finkelstein time this does not suffer from any continuation. Uh, that's kind of dictates you why you are supposed to choose this gauge uh, for this outer equilibrium from this. What is the radial direction V? This suffers this continuation near the horizon. So this gives you the 
the path, the analytic continuation in going from one arm of this sugar cane leaf complex to other arm through the bulb. Okay. So let me show you how this analytic function path looks in the bulb. And this gives rise to, this is essentially the horizon cross F construction. So suppose, now since the sigma does not have any non I mean non trivial continuation, so we'll just first consider the diagram at a x sigma. Okay. So suppose we start at this point in the boundary, and then I move all the way to the horizon. I want to go from here to here through the bulb. So I go to the horizon. Now near the horizon, I have the analytic continuation. And as I keep going, I reach the other point. And this is what is called this horizon gap thing. Now the idea is that it is at a fixed sigma, but if you evolve this diagram in sigma, then this lower arm is supposed to generate the one arm, the forward going arm of the Schrodinger British contour, and this upper arm is supposed to generate the reverse arm of this contour. So let me tell you how this happens. So at outer equilibrium, we only have this one quarter, this R, say this R region. Okay. And let's see how this path looks in this R sheet. So I start from the boundary and move along B. So in, in this, along this, suppose I start from here, and as I keep moving to the horizon along V, that means I'm moving in this direction. So V is along this and sigma is along this. So, so I go here, I come here, then I cross it along some imaginary direction, but then I do not have the other side to go. So I'll essentially take a second copy of this, and then I, so I have to realize this arm in this copy, and as the direction of V is reversed, so that means you are coming along this. So go along this, cross it, come along here. These are points on the contour. So to generate the contour, now you have to evolve these arms in time. And the rule is that if you evolve this lower arm in upward direction, you have to evolve this upper arm in the lower direction. I'll tell you why that is in the next slide. But for the now, take my words from this. Okay. So now if you essentially join these two, to get this boundary, this is the Schwinger Kildish contour at the boundary, where the time is flowing in opposite direction. And this this entire region is this the bulb analog, and this is the bulb extension of this uh, Schwinger Kildish contour. Okay. This is much like this Van Skin, this Van Dries, but it does not depend on any requiring doing conditions. So, okay. so this is the bulb. So, so how it works? So essentially, you take the blackness this time and you double it and you move it across the cap. That's why it's called the horizon cap. And uh, magnetic condition from the lower arm to upper arm is this. However, you have to remember that the geometry, as I said, at every order is actually regular and analytic at v equal to one. So it's essentially the same geometry over the entire two-fold space time. It's the same, for example, in this bulk world of this. Uh, the same space time throughout. However, you have to remember one thing that since the orientation of V is reversed in the two arm, you have to also reverse the orientation of sigma in the two arms. Okay. Such that the entire space time have a same orientation. The volume from is invariant in both the arms. Okay. So this is essentially the so that's why you I told you that one arm. So and this also ensures that one arm is like going up, the other is going down at the boundary. So that gets you I mean, this Schwinger kill this part. Okay. So, this is the entire horizon cap, cap contribution, and it's supposed to work at out of equilibrium because it's constructed explicitly at epsilon, at epsilon equal to zero. But before going to that, we'll do some consistency check with this. I mean, is it at all trustworthy? I mean, okay, it's, it follows from certain order transformation. I mean, Analytic conclusion, so on. But let's see. I mean, how much I mean it's trustable. So the idea is that uh, the horizon cap is supposed to work out of equilibrium. It's epsilon equal to zero construction. Okay. But even at thermal equilibrium, one can choose at thermal equilibrium. One has the freedom to choose any value of epsilon. For example, epsilon equal to beta by two was this crucial case, but zero is like this in going into the first time. You can choose this. Okay. So if we now Compute this boundary showing a Kelly's correlator using this technique at equilibrium to get the thermal results. Okay, so let's see that. So for that, 
just consider a scalar field in this two-fold space system. Okay. This space time can be anything, any black hole space, not necessarily the dual of the biotic or anything. So it's any uh, static black hole space time in any dimension. Of okay. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so as I said, that you have to solve the field in the entire two-fold geometry, and you have to go to the boundary condition uh, to the boundary to impose this boundary conditions to compute the project and so on. So you need to know the field over this entire two-fold contour. And the idea is that you first solve with a lower arm, you come close to the horizon, continue, and you get the solution to the upper. It's exactly like that. And again, a good basis is given by this in and out solutions. And this in and out solutions near the horizon has this behavior. Okay. So the in mode is like this, and the out mode no more is analytic. So now you have to recall the analytic continuation in going from one arm to the other arm. And if you use that, then you can essentially write down the field in the entire upper arm. So with this, now you can actually define what you call a field matrix, which is like a column matrix of the upper and lower arm, which is given by this. Okay. So this field matrix defines you the field over the entire two-fold space time. Now you can essentially take this uh, uh, solution at the boundary. And there you can, I mean, from this near boundary expansion, you can identify the source and the wave. Okay. Now we want to see how does this source and the wave are related to this in and out modes. For okay. that, assume that this in and out modes have this near boundary expansion of this form. So for the in modes, this source is like small a and wave is capital A. For the out modes, the source is like small b and the wave is capital A. Then this J and K O matrix are essentially given by this. I'll call this S as some source matrix and this R as some response. Okay. This contains the response from both in and out, both from the source from the field. So now imposing boundary condition, this density boundary condition is like you, you write this Q in terms of J by inverting this matrix. And this matrix is perfectly invertible because of this factor. So if, if you put it here, Q, then you can essentially impose your boundary condition. This phi is in written in terms of J. Okay. And you can also write this, this response in terms of this source by inverting this Q from, by you substituting Q from this relation here, you essentially get this structure. Okay. So I've related the source of the matrix in terms of this R and S matrix. So now that we have imposed this boundary conditions so on, we can now compute the I mean, the actual action and hence the correlator and see if it gives you the desired result. But here comes one uh, subtlety, and that is like so, had it been a usual space time, one fold, then this onshell action for this minimally coupled scalar is just a term on the boundary. But now it has this gap. Okay, so when you compute the onshell action, this B integral. This path of these actually goes from here to here. It has a contour, and it comes from here to here. But this entire this path, we can write this onshell action as this boundary term. But for this, but then we have to deal with this contour integral at B equal to one. Does it give any contribution? So essentially, we have to look for poles here. So it turns out that the outgoing modes they have they give rise to certain poles. For example, this term gives you a pole of order two, whereas this has a, pole, a zero of order one. So essentially this gives you a pole of order one. And this term again gives you a pole of order one, but these are regular. And it so happens that these two poles exactly cancel each other. At least, I mean, at, at, at least at equilibrium it does. Okay. So there's actually no contribution from this gap and the entire contribution comes from this boundary. So yeah, this is a very a crucial point that this poles, the, the contribution on the cap does not contribute at leading order. I mean, for a static geometries. Okay, so now we have, I mean, so now this onshell action for this million coupling scalar is this, the standard. And you can do the standard things like writing O in terms of J using this and then taking functional derivatives. But what we suggest is that you just compute this object, which is, in the at least in moment and say this is our show. So the sigma three is actually the polyspin matrix one zero zero minus one, which take care of this minus sign. Okay. So the simple algorithm is that so you first solve for the field 
And if you solve for the in and out modes in the lower arm, and you find the source and wave with which you construct these matrices R and S. And then you, uh, so essentially, so just to solve in one arm, you get the major, you need not bother about this other arm because we have shown you what does this R and S looks. Uh, let me actually show it again. So, yeah, so this R and S, these are, for example, solution in just the lower arm, okay. And it depends on this wave and source of this in and out mode. So you compute this in and out modes, find the source and wave, construct these matrix. And then, so this is essentially, you have to forget about, forget about this function. It follows from that, but this is a compact, I mean, thing you can directly compute. You need not even bother about this upper arm also. So now let us see that this object, what does this give you? So as you replace the value, I mean, as you use the components of this matrix R and S, this is what you get in terms of, a, okay, I should be using, I think, yeah, uh, zero means it's static. Okay. This is the matrix that you get. And there are no results from thermal field theory that for any, actually I should write it actually, var epsilon. The sigma is like the var, this separation between, so I've taken this from somewhere where they say that the separation between low and zero now is sigma. For our case, is like this var epsilon. Okay. So for any sigma, the schwinger I mean, Green's function at thermal field theory is given by this. Whereas we have this result. So as we see that this exactly reproduces this, if we make these certain identifications along with this condition. Now this condition is actually hold by this solution that you can check easily. So what it says is that here, this GR is the retarded response and this A0, B0, this is the wave of the ingoing and this is the source of the ingoing. So it's saying that the retarded response is completely determined by the ingoing and the, and the advanced and the uh, advanced response is actually determined in terms of this outgoing mode source. And this is exactly the sound steadiness description. So in this way, using the horizon cap and this matrix uh, thing, you exactly reproduce your sound steadiness. And it also we know that this matrix certain and it satisfy KMS periodicity. Okay, so this horizon cap construction essentially gives you the correct result at thermal equilibrium. At static uh, thing, so we can actually now use this machinery for the out of equilibrium context. Okay. Kavi, can I make few comments? Small comments. So, firstly, uh, this uh, prescription of horizon cap is not exactly equivalent to the Sons absorb because for the two point function, exactly it, it is fine. But if you want to go to like three point function, if you have to do something like this. Uh, then there's an ambiguity in the in the earlier case whether you where you integrate the bulk vertex. And here you only have one side, and there you have to. So it's not quite clear these two are equal if you go to higher point functions. So the horizon cap prescription, of course, uh, is easily generalizable out of equilibrium where there is no analog of two sides. Okay. The other the other comment is that this uh, small comment is that this whole cancellation is very similar to uh, the choice of the Temperature such that uh, the derivation of the Hopkins temperature from Euclidean continuation that you require the conical singularity to vanish at the tip at the horizon. It's similar to that actually because it, it gives you the same result for beta. It's just uh, this okay, just like that. Okay, but uh, yeah, but I'm yeah, that's right. But uh, okay, so now before going to this. Uh, of can, I, can I make a comment? Yeah, sure. Like it, all this is at, le at the level of some quadratic action, right? Sorry? This or everything you're saying is at the level of quadratic action at the moment, right? This is all two point functions and so on. Yeah, so I'm talking about this yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then this pole cancellation is a somewhat trivial statement that quadratic actions give rise to boundary terms as the effective. If you integrate them on shell, you get boundary terms. Okay, so, so here's, uh, yeah, it's. Okay, here I want to mention, emphasize one thing. I mean, if you go back to the usual uh, original CG, I mean, this Hungry paper, so what they perform is a small omega expansion. Okay, so for example, this term is order omega zero, this term is order omega one. So there it does not, I mean, so, uh, so as uh, I, mean, I mean, so there it is, this pose, these two poles do not exactly cancel. But in our case, I mean, 
what will happen? We are not, will be not doing this small omega. So our result will be true for any omega. So it's like a late phase function, but there these two poles will exactly cancel. Yeah. That's right. uh, but, uh, but even, even there, like uh, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is quadratic action. If you evaluate on shell, it should be some boundary term. And hence you won't get any contribution from the horizon is kind of a trivial statement, right? Yeah, something it's not that obvious. Uh, it's not that obvious. It's not usual, right? Uh, I mean, what you were saying is correct. But I mean, this path is not the usual bulk path that we consider. I mean, the conventional. The integration contour is about a complexified uh, radial coordinate, so it's not obvious that the only contributions come from the boundary. Because if we enclose poles or poles, then you have to take care of it. Essentially, what you are showing is that you are only getting contribution from the branch cut, not the pole. There is no pole, which is very important. And if, if this is true, that there's only a branch point and no pole at the horizon, then the contribution are indeed only from the boundaries. As, and as Abhik said, uh, the Hongliu, uh, originally, they couldn't show that uh, actually uh, it is we who showed this uh, through this matrix method uh, that um, uh, so we showed it through the matrix method that uh, this K condition and so on standards prescription is recovered at any arbitrary frequency. Uh, so let me tell you, I mean, yeah, so, okay. So before going to this out of equilibrium, so let me mention this, if this that does not happen, then this contribution will affect your finger kill dish thing. And this GR will not be, so it, it, it will probably change this G11, not G12, but this GR will change and it will no longer be given by then going modes alone. So this uh, cancellation is actually very crucial. Uh, is that what you wanted to say? Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, that and yeah, that is important also that uh, that's okay, but that's, yeah, effectively, yes. I mean, you will not recover sound standards prescription if the horizon yeah. Contribution. And the other thing is that, I mean, the, so out of equilibrium, I mean, there is another notion of apparent horizon. But and, and in the case that, okay, I'll comment on this when I come to out of equilibrium. So let me just keep it. The idea is that this cap has to construct at the event horizon and not any apparent horizon because then we'll not, I mean, then the causality of this boundary property. Okay, I'll comment on that in the next session. So I don't, I, so how much time do I left with? I think we start five minutes late. And you have basically 10 minutes, <laughs> but. Okay, I'll probably take a five, yeah. 10 minutes more. Uh, so this part, as I said, I mean, so now we have this horizon cap prescription and we have this uh, matrix formula for the Schoenigel's correlators. Now we'll, and we trust it at least, I mean, at, at equilibrium. So now we'll see how can we generalize it with beyond equilibrium. So this part will be some technical, so I'll mainly talk about the main key points. I will not go to the every mathematical detail. So again, you now introduce, so now in this case, we have this geometry that lives on this two arm, essentially the bulk dual of this Bjorken flow, which is not necessarily static. Okay, and you consider the same scalar field here. But the first key point is you have to look at this answers for this scalar field. Okay. There I was doing momentum spreads and now I'm explicitly writing in position phase for a reason. So as you can see, that this, so there are quite a few points here to know. First of all, you know that the conjugate momentum of these variables and not the usual canonical omega TNT, but it also has certain, okay, this part is just nothing with a omega times a factor, it's fine. But you can see that the conjugate variable of the zeta and this x are not exactly momentum, but it also has a time, I mean, a point of view. Okay, uh, this is, I mean, I will give you the justification of these answers in the less level, but it's a consequence of the fact that my space is like still expanding and contracting. Okay. So this takes care of that. There's also another piece here. I mean, again, I'll explain the role of this gamma naught in, in, in the next two or three slides. And then I have performed, I mean, this I expanded the field, just like the matrix, I'm now expanding the field in sigma. Okay, so this is my answer in this dynamical geometry. And uh, okay, you can actually cast it to canonical form by redefining your momentum, then it becomes this form, but you have to keep in mind that this kappa L kappa T are now sigma dependent. So, yeah, so now if you, if you feed these answers to the equation of motion, then this is the equation that get a various order in the sigma expansion, but this D, so the leading equation is uh, homogeneous, I mean, homogeneous, the subleading are, they have inhomogeneous equations with source coming from previous orders in this expansion. 
and consider the metric from the previous order as well as the fields at the previous order. So the subject equations are inhomogeneous, and this differential operator is essentially given by this. Okay. And the, again, we, we are supposed to play the same game. You solve in one arm, you just continue it to the upper arm. Now let's see what happens at leading and subleading order. So at leading order, the equation is homogeneous and it exactly takes this form. And this is okay, it may not be obvious from here, but you can take a check that this is exactly the scalar equation of a scalar field in a static Laplace vector. And this only follows because we have, to, so our geometry, I mean, it has, I said, is the spatial, I mean, the, the spatial expansion and, expansion and contraction, but we have scaled this momentum such that with that modified answer and in this modified space time at the leading order, the equation of motion still like the static background. So had we chosen usual e to the power i k zeta time thing, we would have not done it. So that sort of validates that answer. Okay. So now once you have static black holes, the leading order story is exactly similar. So you solve in one arm in this, in our cases, you go to the other arm and this is your leading order matrix that you, I mean the field matrix. Okay. Now the main question is that, can we generalize this beyond equilibrium, this structure? So for that, I have to ensure that this fields at the boundary is near the, sorry, at near the horizon. So what are these things? So this object becomes, I mean, this one, uh, yeah. So, okay. So this field matrix near the horizon takes this form, eta omega times this one minus V equal to the power. I mean, this outgoing modes has this one minus V to the power near the horizon. Point is, do we have this structure? Because if we have this structure, then I can write this answers at any order. But that is not obvious at the subleading order. Okay. Uh, so as I said, that subleading order, the equations are inhomogeneous. So there is a homogeneous part and a particular part. So what I mean by this is that the particular part has contribution from this previous order. For example, if I'm at phi one, then you will get contribution from phi zero and g one. Okay. It also has a homogeneous part, which is independent. So well, now let us see how this modes behave near the horizon. So the near horizon behave, so let us see first then how this particular modes behave near the horizon. And as well, okay, so near the horizon, it has, I mean, some pole structure, which coming from this source, I'll explain later. But if you remove that pole, then the near horizon behavior of this uh, particular solution is something like this. Okay. They go to zero. I mean, you cannot take, you cannot continue this and go to the other arm at v equal to one. Well, but still you are left with this, okay. So we have the desired behavior that we want is that this thing that subleading order is n for any n at v equal to one, they must behave like this leading order thing up to some proportionality constant, this gamma n and this gamma out. Okay, so this condition which, re, which is required to construct this uh, field matrix at any order, they will essentially fix this homogeneous part. So now you can write the full solution in this way. Because now you can see as you go close to the horizon, this part goes to zero, and this essentially gives you this gamma i gamma n, q naught, and this gives you this. Okay. So using this boundary condition at the horizon, we can essentially get the same structure, but now we have to deal with this additional unwanted pieces. Okay, we have to fix, I'll show how to fix this. So once we have this structure that the near horizon will be exactly the same as leading order, then I can write this field matrix at any order. However, I mean, I have to keep in mind that uh, this we have, we have this gamma in, this gamma in out, this gamma not. These three objects are there in the solution. We have to fix them. Okay. So essentially, I mean, the field matrix, I mean, in terms of this, this we can we will write this way. This matrix will call this M matrix and collectively we will call it something like this. And these are like this coefficients of this expansion. And this gamma naught is there. So this is now like my field answer at every order. So now I have to fix this constant to define the solution unambiguously. So how do you do that? So as I said that this subleading equations are inhomogeneous. And it happens that the outgoing modes of the previous order, for example, at phi one, you'll get the outgoing modes of this phi zero out, they give rise to poles of order one and two in the So for example, if you write down the particular part of the solution, 
at first subleading order. It gets the contribution from this P0, which is the outgoing mode of previous order. And it has this pool of order one and order two. Okay. So to get the desired desired behavior at the horizon, we have to cancel these pools. And the way to cancel is that we can cancel this double pool by fixing this alpha one. Once I fix this alpha one, we can cancel this single pool by fixing this gamma one. Okay. If you go to the next order, then you can see you will have again the same pool structure, but you can again fix using the this alpha one by the for information is the residual gauge freedom of the EF gauge. We did not fix there, but now we are fixing it to regulate the gap. Okay. So the moral of the story is that regulating the outgoing modes at order n uniquely fixes your alpha n and gamma n minus one alpha. Okay. But still, um, there are a few points. That is also have to note that this alpha n fixation initially said that this alpha n shifts your horizon from v equal to one. Right, but it so happens that the mode, this is value of this alpha n, which regulates the outgoing mode, also takes care of the fact that the horizon is pinned to v equal to one, and which happens at any order. So regulating the outgoing mode is like uh, fixing this uh, horizon gap at v equal to one at every order. And this is a statement which is, this mass does not enter into this picture, so it's true. And the other thing that the same alpha n does, it even for the subleading order. It leads to this pole cancellation. Now, what happens is that at subleading order, these two poles do not exactly cancel like at leading order. That depends on this alpha one. So happens as you regulate this outgoing mode, these two poles also get cancelled, which is very essential for our construction. So we are done. We have fixed this unwanted thing, this gamma naught, this gamma in one out is alpha, but there's still one thing that's gamma in, in the last thing that we fix. And this we fix by this claim that even out of equilibrium, the retarding of the one propagator are still related by this uh, time reverse, I mean this complex conjugation in momentum space. So I'll show how you fix this. If you compute the, if you identify your retarded and the advanced thing, and if you claim that they're still complex conjugate, that will, because the ongoing one, the, Sorry, sorry. Out of equilibrium, uh, what uh, there is no momentum. I mean, there are two uh, independent arguments. So you have to interchange the arguments, right? To go sorry, from what? out of equilibrium, you have to interchange the arguments to go from retarded to advanced. You cannot. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean the argument flipping. I mean because I mean. momentum is, uh, is is it doesn't only depend on the difference. So it's not only. Yeah. So the thing is that this ingoing mode that will contain this gamma in. So when you claim that this GA is equal to GR star, or I mean this coordinates flip, then I mean that will, that will fix this gamma in. Okay. So so now we essentially have this. Uh, so finally we are at the last step, extracting the propagator. So now we have written the field in this form, and we have taken care of this gamma naught which is like some linear function of omega. So what we'll do, we'll essentially absorb this factor here. So actually there's omega sigma I've missed here. And I'll define a new time variable conjugate to this omega, which is this S of sigma. Okay, that takes care of this gamma naught thing. And uh, yeah, but this S is actually, I mean, so if I go here, so if you, if you, if you adjust this in the, here, for example, with the sigma term, then if you define your S, then this S is this one. And one particular thing is that at late time, this S exactly it gives you this. I mean, it's proportional to sigma, but not at time. Okay. So with this, and now, uh, I mean, we have fixed this up to this gamma n in. So we know the solution exactly. And like, again, I mean, it's the same old thing. Okay. So we can write this expansion now in terms of this, I'll write this form facts make the same. And so once we have the solution, now we know the source and the wave exactly like before. We can define this S and R, which are to be identified from the expansion of the same standard thing. And we can also parameterize this S and R in terms of the in and out modes of this M matrix, because if this M matrix has this form, just like before, and, and if the in and out modes have this expansion, then we can also again write this S and R just like before in this way. But here we have to keep one thing in mind that all the objects here, the function of dot dot dot, the capital, yeah, 
all the objects here are actually have an expansion in terms of sigma. That you have to keep in mind. Uh, hi, can I clarify something? Yeah, sure. Uh, we are solving some scalar equation on this uh, Bjorken background, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then it has it's a second order equation. There are two parameters to fix. Yes. Just 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 the two sources. But then uh, what is uh, I'm I'm kind of uh, I'm not following. What is what were these freedoms you fixed when you cancel the poles at the horizon? Yeah. I mean, where where did those freedoms come from? Okay, so let me tell you that this. Uh, first of all, this alpha one, I mean, as you go, so when you construct in this rate and fixed time gauge, as you go beyond leading order, they come from the residual uh, diffeomorphisms of, of this rate and fixed time gauge. Okay, that's how this. Alpha so, so, one. so are you saying as you solve any scalar field, according to the scalar field, scalar you have field. to. This has to do with solving the geometry and the expansion. Right, 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 right. But uh, sorry, right now, are we solving Einstein equations? No, no. So see, this alpha one is related to the residual gauge field of the any time in the any time going any time in the gauge, right? Correct. So first constructed so, a dual in order yes. by order function. So 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 then as you solve the scalar field phi, you have to fix the residual gauge freedoms in the background metric. Yeah. Is that the statement? No, no. So the yeah, yeah, gauge, that's the statement. Yeah, that's yeah. the statement. I mean, the but then but itself has this gauge, gauge extra gauge on fixed freedom that you need that you are fixing. But then, why is it clear that as you uh, as you solve for another scalar field uh, field or a different field on this background, the same fixings will work? Okay, this does. Well, we don't have a. Okay, so it seems like this. Uh, okay, let me go to that part. So, for instance, these coefficients seem to be very much tied to which scalar field you are solving for. And uh, uh, let me get to this. Yeah, yeah. So say that I mean this. If you fix this alpha, I mean this alpha ends and this gamma out, and then that fixes the poles that comes from this, uh, you know, which is the source term in these inhomogeneous equations. Okay, so okay, let me tell you this. Let me go back. So what I essentially want is that at subleading order, my fields near the horizon should behave this way, because I want to construct the field matrix at every order in the same way. Okay, so now there is a issue is that, I mean, if you try to see the behavior of this uh, field near the horizon, this particular part, then what happens, there are poles that come from previous order, which you have to fix. Unless you cannot get this condition and you cannot define the matrix. Okay, so that requires uh, to, uh, to fix this uh, alpha and this, uh, yeah, you are saying that, yeah. So what you are saying is that if you regulate this uh, outgoing mode, and that essentially fix the residual freedom. I mean, we are using the residual freedom. In this Question way. that actually is asking Abhik is that uh, suppose you fix alpha for one scalar field with a certain mass, how do you know it will work for another scalar field with another mass? I think that's the question Akhil is yeah, asking. Yeah, so if you if you keep redefining your residual free background gauge freedoms, like the gravity metric for every field you have, like it's it seems like a bad strategy, right? To like uh, like read if keep redefining the background as you keep on solving for a particular field okay uh, then i can say the other okay so you can the way you can uh, so the answer a week is that simply that it turns out that uh, you already answered the question it turns out the choice of alphas is exactly where the which gives you the horror the event horizon is pinned at uh, the yeah. z is equal to one so that turns that the answer is completely independent of the mass of the field. I mean, it turns out so it's not the apparent horizon; it's the event horizon, only the event horizon. And that is something we don't have a proof, but we have checked up to many high, many orders. And uh, so there we have found that uh, the event horizon is fixed uh, by this alpha is exactly where the event horizon is. Is the horizon cap is actually only at the event horizon at a non-equilibrium event horizon. I mean, you, you, so I think his objection is that uh, how, why should we use that freedom from the matrix in fixing certain things in the field? Yeah, I mean, probably that's what you're asking. Yeah, for instance, like now you solve for fermions or like some complicated gauge fields or something. Like every time you do it, and and further you have to go further and solve for gravity and so on. Like I mean, I'm just saying like. 
you have to, if you have to, if you have to invoke the event horizon, right? Naturally, it should be at the event horizon. Simply, it, okay, we don't have a proof yet, but it, naturally, it should be because if you look into dual field theory, the evolution is always causal, or Schwinger Keldish, uh, the Schwinger Dyson equation is causal, and and therefore, in the bulk, you should also have a causal evolution. And if you just look at, uh, if you if you just if you just look at the geometry outside the non-equilibrium event horizon, that is also causal. I mean, you can have a causal evolution there. So, uh, so they, therefore, it's very crucial that the actually it's 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 a, it's a heuristic logic, but actual calculations do show that if you require the pole to cancel, we have to fix alpha always at the event horizon, and that is irrespective of what whichever field you consider. We have only looked for scalar fields. You are right; you have not looked into fermions and all. But it turns out to be at least for the scalar field of arbitrary mass. It's always at the event horizon. It's independent so, of the so, mass. So the con, so the conjecture is you could have fixed that gauge from the get go, and uh, the, you wouldn't find any uh, poles yeah, or yeah. anything. You still would have got a single pole. You still would have got a single pole, not a double pole. You still would have yeah, got a single yeah. pole. A single pole again. The single pole is also remarkably independent of the mass. This uh, that's also what we see. I mean, uh, at any order, the, the single pole gammas are also independent of the mass. Basically, it should be given by some uh, one. Another way to say it is that is basically you should have some geometric op optics approximation at the horizon, so it's, the mass becomes invisible. Anyway, yeah, maybe we can discuss. Let me just finish in less five minutes. Okay, so yeah, so essentially we have read up this uh, R and S matrix, but now all of this has an expansion sigma. So now I can really write down my means function using the same formula as I used before. But now we have to keep in mind that there's an additional thing hanging around, which is like the Jacobian of this sigma to S transformation. And so this factor is there. And so this is the structure, okay? This, uh, and if you use the matrix, uh, exact components of this matrices, then this is what you get for the components of this finger uh, correlators. So this is, has a, apparently a, thermal structure at every order in it. Okay, this looks like the static results, but there's a crucial difference is that now this unwanted see the sigmas are still hanging around, okay, both in everywhere, okay. Other than that, it has a apparent uh, thermal structure at every order, which is probably a consequence of the fact that we have pinned the horizon at a static value at every order, okay, at a constant value. That's one, I mean, this is probably one signature. So now let us, okay, so now I'm in the final two slides. Uh, so do we get back again? So what are the leading order results, the thermal uh, results? For that we have to do, so as I said, that this, uh, this Bjorken, uh, this scalar field, this Bjorken background at leading order is exactly like the scalar field in static background. Okay, so the example that I studied before. So the Green's function that, I mean, the schwinger keldysh function that you compute is exactly matched with the thermal showing a Kelly's matrix. Okay. So how do we recover that from this jump? So for that, the way first you have to take the late type limit uh, sensibly. So the way we do is as follows. So there is two time arguments, sigma one, sigma two. We write in terms of this average and this relative time. And the late time, what we mean is that the sigma bar goes to infinity, but this sigma, I mean, the relative value is fixed. So the average value goes to infinity, but the relative value is fixed. So yeah. So that is how we uh, so take this late and, and the expansion essentially means expansion in sigma bar inverse. Okay. So now if you take this retarded and advanced thing, so now you have to use this fact that S is given by this. Okay. And if you, if you, so for example, at leading order, this S is actually given by its constant. Okay. So sorry. Not one, right? It's D minus one by D. Minus one over D minus two. Yeah. So leading order, this term simply drops out. So S is proportional to sigma, and S primes are just numbers. And you have to use the fact, that, so now you have to use the expansion of this object. So at leading order, what you'll get is essentially is A0 over B0, and the S term essentially goes up. And this is exactly, again, as I said, that this is now like a proper uh, means function, because it's now determined by this ingoing and outgoing. There's no unwanted sigma hanging around. So essentially, we covered the strong sound sinus prescription. That essentially imply that if you now write down the full matrix, you can this. They have the exact thermal structure as before. 
and we reproduce the results at uh, sigma equal to zero. I mean, again, what I mean is that there I've shown you. So again, we get back the consistent, but uh, okay, now I'll show this result in position space, which is like a new thing that we're doing. To get this, so we have computed this g hat zero. So now we have to do this complicated integral to get in position space. And at leading order, the answer is something like this. So this is, this is uh, maybe it's sigma one, this is a sigma two, they are leading order. It's like just sigma one minus sigma two. So it's with some factor. And this case, this thing, so now when you do this integration, and this part is actually sigma independent. So now as you do this integration, this is very simple. So this is what you get, okay. So this was actually initially computed uh, by Janik and Pistansky uh, at, uh, for homogeneous fluctuations. There's no spatial dependence, but now we have kept it. And what we recover is that the desired behavior. So obviously it's transition invariance, that is fine. But now if you look at this scalings, this is actually uh, uh, the signature that the, my space time is expanding along this longitudinal direction and it's shrinking along this transverse direction. Earlier they did it for uh, homogeneous case, so they did not notice this behavior, but now exactly because of this. So all the things are, uh, so yeah, this is my result, our result for leading order. And for subleading, I'll just be very sketchy. I mean, so again, we have to essentially do the sigma bar expansion of this object. Because once we know the expansion of this, we essentially know the because know the full schwinger kilich matrix. So they are essentially parameters in terms of the schwinger matrix. And at first subleading order, there is essentially three sources for the sigma bar correction. One comes from this S prime terms. The second one comes from this uh, matrices because they have this expansion in terms of sigma. And there's another one that comes from the Taylor expansion of this argument. Okay, because this kappa L and kappa T, these are actually now, as I said, they have a sigma dependent. So when you take into account all these three, then this is what you get at uh, first sub leading order. And you can keep repeating. So all you need to know is this function, this, this A0, V0, you have to, once you know the solutions, then essentially, you know, using this uh, technique, you can essentially compute at any order. Okay. And you can again go back to position space. So this is, for example, our result at uh, first subleading order. And here, as you can see, there's additional sigma R dependence, which comes from this expansion. So, so this captures this condition. So now when you take two minutes, because uh, then we can take what? a finish in like two, three minutes, then we can take yeah, 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 I'm done essentially. So now as you, so now uh, this, this A0, and the small a zero, they essentially uh, have this gamma and in. So now when you impose that these two are essentially complex conjugate, that will fix your gamma and in. So now, I mean, that unwanted thing is also solved in some sense. So this is essentially our schwinger uh, matrix out of uh, equilibrium. You can generate it to arbitrary higher order uh, as much as numerical strength you have. Okay, so let me summarize. So what we have done, we essentially computed the, the, the stringer Kelly's solution of the Georgian flow beyond equilibrium. And in this context, we have constructed the holographic dual of this, both the flow and its scalar fluctuation in a, over a complexified two-fold manifold in a systematic rate time expansion. The second thing that we have done is how to implement this uh, prescription, CGL prescription out of equilibrium. In a, so at leading order, I mean, this record that, so in the context of Bjorken flow at leading order, what we have to do, we have to do certain rescalings that essentially fix it to a constant temperature flow. So the cap was at fixed horizon, at the horizon, the cap was at a fixed horizon, static horizon. But for subleading order, I mean, we have shown that this required fixing of certain residual gauge. If you fix that uh, uniquely, then you can always, uh, pin this uh, this cap at horizon, and you only get uh, causal. I mean, the as I said that this swinger Dyson equation that give you causal uh, evolution of the boundary. For that, you need to pin this horizon cap at the event horizon, and that is essentially at higher order. That is essentially fixed by this residual gauge fixing, and this can actually can be replicated to various other flows or equilibrium. And the last thing is that, I mean, uh, we, have, uh, we have, with our, this, with this uh, horizon gap description and this matrix approach, we have reproduced the previous result. 
So we can essentially trust our result uh, beyond equity three. And there are some uh, future obvious direction like, I mean, so if you consider this charge particle, I mean, this colliding particle to be chargeless, but you can also consider the effect of charge. So it's like a magnetic field. And then you have this additional gauge field, uh, like uh, Akhil was saying, and then th this problem will probably be a little involved. Like in case of the gauge field in the bulk, how does this analytic combination work? Beyond equilibrium, that's one thing. The other thing is to lift the initial assumption of longitudinal invariance. So then you have essentially a radial, for example, you can generalize it to a Gaussian flow where you have azimuthal symmetry, but the flow is radially outward. Okay. And I mean, uh, the, the structure of the Green's function, the coordinates that we have, for example, the scalar, uh, this Green's function uh, coordinator is like a scalar mode of stress tensor. So, we, the, and the, the form that we get in the lifting expansion of, you know, can be, you can say, well, I mean, Borel reason to find the correlations for I mean this symmetric correlation that uh, for the hydrodynamic attractor of this uh, flow. So that is the yeah in principle you can do that. So yeah that's okay thanks so the talk questions yes. Uh, this this fixing of this uh, residual symmetries you said like uh, also works for arbitrary order in this sigma expansion is it? Sorry, can you repeat? I was uh, what, what, this are uh, the this residual degrees when you fixed it uh, to fix all these poles and so on. Like, uh, did you say it also worked in arbitrary orders in sigma expansion or? Yeah, at least we check for order two. Beyond that, I mean, it's typically I mean. We need a lot of numerical handling, but yeah, at least up to order two, this happens exactly. I mean, up to seconds of reading, it happens. Yeah, actually, uh, you need to cancel not only the double pole, but also the single pole. Uh, if you don't cancel the poles, uh, the, in each order, the problem is that uh, your in retarded propagator, which you get from G11 minus G12, that is not uh, given only by the ingoing mode. And if it is not given by the ingoing mode, then the retarded propagator is not causal response. Uh, even at out of equilibrium, the retarded propagator, the linear response theory works even out of equilibrium. So it should be always causal response and given only by the ingoing mode. And that's also obvious from the uh, Kessler aspect and evolution where you have analytic analytic at the horizon. So, uh, so this is very important. And so the cancellation of the pole at each order is very important uh, without that. And it's quite remarkable that this here you don't see the mass at all. This pole, so uh, that's essentially because of geometric optics approximation. Uh, so, so, if you, uh, so if you're saying if you if you hold the horizon fixed, uh, uh, it wouldn't it mean that you're not like you, you this procedure if you do like start doing gravity calculations and all wouldn't uh, let your entropy change or something? Is that true or? No, no, the entropy, uh, just because the horizon is fixed only a gauge effect, right? it's a residual gauge freedom, but the horizon location is fixed, but the entropy is changing because the, the, the volume factor that at the horizon is changing. Right, right? The tra you're saying the transverse factors are changing, I see, I see. Yes, yes, so it's not like the entropy is not increasing, entropy, entropy of course increases. Yeah, I mean, uh, so unless you fix it at horizon, you don't know how to implement this gap and so on. Well, again, the entropy is increasing on the wide scale version. When you have expansion, of course, the entropy also reduces because entropy density reduces the local entropy because it's expanding. And okay, I mean, a big problem didn't stress it. I mean, obviously, you're doing the computation in a wide scale version, but you can go back to the original so job and go so wide simply. Wide. So, I mean, you can yeah. map it back to this. Originally. Assuming of okay, there's no matter anomaly or something there, because matter anomaly anyway is the local effect, and that doesn't really affect state dependent cost.
Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh -huh. So in the Green's function, uh, in the Swinger field, this Green's function, you were multiplying with sigma three. You will. Uh, yes, that is a Pauli spin matrix. Oh, yeah, Pauli spin matrices. Why were multiplying with this Pauli spin matrices? Yeah, because this onshine action, as you see, it has a O one J one minus O two J two. Okay. Hmm. So now what you do, you write your O one in terms of say J one J one one J one J one J one two. Sorry, J two. Sorry, O one. Yeah, it will be like. J one two J two J one it's like that right G two one J one J two and G two two J two J two right so if you take functional derivative with respect to this uh, I mean sources so what happens is that this G two two and this G two one they will have this minus sign because of this so and what the sigma three does is essentially puts that minus sign as sorry. It just multiplies the lower row with this. Okay, okay. Star. Thank you. Any mm -hmm. other question? Okay, it seems to be not. So, and Avik, Avik again, and Avik gave the last talk of our current semester. We will resume probably in August. So until then, have a very nice summer and uh, thank you for coming and thank you for joining. See you again. Have a nice summer break. Bye.